For some, whistleblowers serve a greater good, speaking truth to power and revealing crimes and misdemeanors. For others, they do nothing but harm, undermining security and destabilizing authority. Which is it? And do we need them? This is Roundtable. Hello there, welcome to the program. I'm Shuli Ghosh. The Trump administration is currently embroiled in an impeachment crisis, and it was all sparked by a whistleblower. The role of whistleblowers has long been debated, from the first known case back in the 18th century, right through to the Edward Snowdens and Chelsea Mannings of modern history. But why do they do it? And do we need them for democracy? Whistleblowers are speaking truth to power from Wall Street to Washington and across the globe. President Trump's impeachment inquiry was instigated by a whistleblower revealing his call with Ukraine's president and bringing it to the public's attention. The ongoing case highlights a wider reality of how whistleblowers are treated, with Trump calling the whistleblower a spy. The president started threatening the whistleblower, threatening others, uh, calling them traitors and spies and suggesting that, uh, you know, we used to give the death penalty uh, to traitors and spies and maybe we should think about that again. Whistleblowers like Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning leaked national security information and disclosed classified documents. They were prosecuted under the Espionage Act, a law written a hundred years ago in the US to deal with spies. Tom Mueller, author of The Crisis of Conscience, said about whistleblowers, we applaud them in the theatre, but we go home and allow industries and governments to destroy them, their careers, their health, their lives. Does everyone who reveals information in the public interest deserve to be a whistleblower? And do we need tougher laws to protect them? So let me introduce today's guests. Joining us on Roundtable from Brussels is Annie Machon, former intelligence officer for the UK's MI5, who was herself a whistleblower. Here in the studio, we have Georgina Holford-Hall, CEO of Whistleblowers UK, Richard Pike, who's a lawyer for whistleblowers, and Naomi Colvin, UK program director for Blueprint for Free Speech. Good to have all of my guests with me. Uh, Annie in Brussels, let me start with you because you and your then partner, David Shaler, released classified documents claiming the British government had been involved in an assassination attempt against Colonel Gaddafi and security services had foreknowledge of the uh, London Israeli embassy bombing, IRA city of London bombing. Let's explore what made you do it? What prompted you to become a whistleblower? I think there are a number of factors. It's a bit like boiling a frog. It takes the frog a while to realize something's wrong. So when we were recruited, we were supposed to be part of a new generation of intelligence officers. The Cold War was over. We were supposed to be working against terrorists. And yet what we found when we joined the organization was that they were still spying on fellow UK citizens. They were spying on government ministers. They were making mistakes in their work against the provisional IRA and then lying to government ministers, their bosses, to cover up those mistakes. And as you mentioned, they um, hid evidence in a trial around the Israeli embassy bombing in 1994. And MI6 was complicit, at the very least, in trying to assassinate Colonel Gaddafi in 1996. Now, we tried to change things on the inside. We and many of our colleagues were concerned about the ethics of the organization back then, and many of us resigned around the same time too. Because they just told us to shut up and just follow orders, we felt we had no alternative but to go to the media. And we took proof to do that in order to stand up the disclosures that we were making. Now, of course, if you come out of the intelligence agencies in the UK, and they are the most legally protected and least accountable of all Western intelligence agencies, you will automatically face prosecution under the Official Secrets Act 1989, and you will automatically go to prison. So indeed, that is what happened to David Shaler twice. First of all, when they failed to extradite him from France, where we were in hiding, and then the second time when he came back to the UK to face trial. To right, face so, can, so can I ask you, because you, you and again. David actually so went on the run, and as you say, to, David, to was, David was eventually jailed for his part. D given all of that, do you regret what you did, or would you do it again? Um, I don't regret it. I'm very proud that we tried to change things. And I think that looking at all the other allegations that have come out since about the UK intelligence agencies, things like the politicization of intelligence taking us into the Iraq war, 
think, allegations of involvement in torture, there is reform that is needed. I think I would have done it slightly differently, knowing what I know now about the media, and perhaps we would have been slightly more effective. But you live and learn. Uh, Richard, legal protection for whistleblowers. Um, uh, Annie uh, prosecuted under the Official Secrets Act. Mm. Yes, that's right. Uh, whistleblowers in the public sector, whether that's in the UK or in the US, have very little protection at all. And even if you're in the private sector and you're bringing forward uh, allegations, the only protection you have in the UK and in many countries is um, in terms of your employment status. But possible. that's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. If someone is, is revealing wrongdoing within a mm. company or within a government, then why aren't they protected? I think there's still a need for cultural change in the sense that uh, whistleblowers are often seen as bringing things forward that maybe shouldn't see the light of day. And it's hard for people to get into the right frame of mind to see this as actually being a positive, something that society should encourage rather than something which um, you know, maybe is a sort of evil necessity, but just something to be dealt with. Do you agree with that, Georgina? Because you, you set up Whistleblowers UK to protect whistleblowers. Yeah, it's, it's to it, Whistleblowers UK is really there to provide help, information and support to try and navigate the legal framework. And we're not lawyers, we have no legal training at all, but it's an understanding of how the mechanisms work. And then, as I, picking up on Annie's point, it's about how do we learn from everybody else's mistakes to try and make it better next time and use that as a means of influencing governments. Because really, the, the responsibility for improvement has to sit with government. Cultural change is needed, but it's got to come from government. This has got to be top-down um, change. It's often governments that um, are at the, uh, the receiving end of, a, of a whistleblower's claims. Well, I, I think it's not always governments that are at the end of receiving end. It's usually organisations. Right. It's co-workers. It's a whole range of different people, including lawyers, the police, law enforcement, and so on. It's not one area. And, and my experience of working with your party parliamentary group for whistleblowing is often they're some of the last to really know what's going on in government. They're so far away. It's stretching the, the line so thinly. Naomi, what is, a, what is the definition of a whistleblower? Uh, it's a great question because it varies depending on who you ask. And in some ways, when you look at the laws which have been passed to protect whistleblowers, whistleblower is sort of, it answers the question itself, right? So whistleblower is defined narrowly and therefore you're only, you're only giving protections to a certain group of people. I think it's always worth remembering that the world of public interest disclosure, so the people who bring forward information in the public interest, is often broader than we use for the term whistleblower. So if we want to take a totally middle of the road definition of what a whistleblower is, it's somebody who brings forward information in the, in the public interest, either internally within their organisation or in extreme cases outside their organisation, um, in a, wor a work-based context. I think that's a sort of general middle of the road definition of what a whistleblower is. But, but there are, there's information often really released by uh, people who hack into systems or uh, documents that are released um, to, uh, to journalists. I mean, we've seen um, Julian Assange uh, leaking lots and lots of documents. Are, are they all whistleblowers? Are they all in the public good? Well, Julian Assange is a publisher, and he's someone who, through his innovations in, in whistleblowing, like he invented a way for whistleblowers to disclose documents totally, anon totally anonymously, um, that's revolutionized the world of whistleblowing. He's not a whistleblower himself, he's a publisher and he's someone who's very important in that world and has really, you know, I think single-handedly turned whistleblowing from an anti-corruption issue into a freedom of expression issue. And what is happening to him now in the, U in the UK in this extradition request from the United States is tremendously worrying and should concern all of us. Um, as I said, the world of public interest disclosure, those who reveal information in the public interest, um, is quite large. It may be larger than some definitions of what a quote-unquote whistleblower is. I'm not so worried about the definition, actually. I think that those who bring forward information in the public interest should not find themselves at risk for doing so, because it's the public interest okay. aspect which is the most important. D presumably you would agree with that, uh, Annie, that uh, a whistleblower is someone who brings forward information in the public interest. Do you think um, that the, the definition applies equally to all the people we've heard described as whistleblowers over the past few years, from Edward Snowden to Chelsea Manning to Julian Assange? I think the, uh, the acid test is actually, is it in the public interest? If it is, and they come forward and allow themselves to be named in public, then they are indeed very brave whistleblowers. 
Um, you mentioned right at the start of this program this uh, alleged whistleblower who's led to the impeachment of the U US president. That person is covered, um, is still anonymous. I would call that a leaker. And we see a lot of leaking coming out of very secret organizations and corporations where names are not put to these people. But in terms of the protection offered to them, there are gradations. Um, so, for example, there has been legislation in the UK to protect whistleblowers in the NHS, and yet we still see mm -hmm. senior doctors having their careers ruined by exposing wrongdoing in hospitals. We see uh, whistleblowers coming out of the intelligence, military, and government, and they not only see their careers ruined, but they actually risk losing their liberty too. And yet when you see whistleblowers coming out of the, uh, say, the financial sector, under the American Frank Dodd law, which applies worldwide and applies to anyone of any nationality, um, you will actually be rewarded financially for your so-called whistleblowing. You get 10% of any of the losses recouped because of what you have done. Some of them have been paid tens of millions of dollars for this. So the treatment varies across sector to sector. It would be nice to see a standardization brought in by governments that offers protection and channels where potential whistleblowers can go to, um, put their concerns on the record, a proper investigation is held and wrongdoing is dealt with. And then that's a win-win situation for the whistleblower and for the organisation. Is, is that something that's happening, that there is... A, a change in mindset and more protection is being put in place for, for whistleblowers. I know you, you've represented several whistleblowers. Um, what are the protections in, in, in place for them? And, and presumably they differ from country to country. They, they do. And interestingly, building on the point Annie made there, we only work for uh, whistleblowers who are able to bring um, complaints, make submissions in the United States. Right. Because there are programs over there where it's possible for whistleblowers to get awards. Uh, at least in some situations. And whilst, um, as Annie says, some of them get tens of millions of dollars, many don't. And it's really just a form of compensation, but it's something better than you can get in the United Kingdom or indeed in most other jurisdictions. But some whistleblowers, uh, I mean, when we look at motivation behind the Panama Papers, for example, mm. uh, the guy who revealed those um, is still known as John Doe because yes. he will not give his uh, identity up because he says he's in fear for his life. Oh, uh, absolutely. And I, I personally wouldn't blame any whistleblower for wanting to remain anonymous. And at least some of the US programs actually allow that. They allow everything to remain totally confidential and anonymous. Um, and when you're talking about people operating in uh, other jurisdictions, for example, in Africa or in the Middle East or Asia, there are many countries where raising your voice could very well get you killed. Um, and also, as you say, where there are criminal organizations involved, of course, that's a risk. Right. So, I, I certainly wouldn't blame any whistleblower for wanting to I mean, some, some people must be extremely brave to do yeah. that. So, I mean, I know that you um, have had personal experience of uh, blowing the whistle on, on, on practices uh, and you ended up yourself being, uh, being arrested. Um, I, I did, and, and I'm unfortunately not alone anymore. And I think Annie probably shares some of my hesitations. And I, again, go back to the point she made about what would you do differently next time? And there's quite a few different things and try and put that into practice every day. But this, this idea that you brought on with, with Richard about what are governments doing? And, and around the world, one of the issues is that they're all doing something different. Yeah. Because we live in a global world, you know, your program's likely to go out to, you know, millions and millions of people who speak different languages, different experiences. And we work in those environments. One of the areas that I'm really focused on is looking at how government can bring in a more harmonised piece of legislation that protects people when they speak out. At the moment, you asked Naomi about what is a whistleblower. Most people who are whistleblowers are just doing their job or just being a really good citizen. They've seen something that's important to them, and it's about recognising... What kind of whistleblowers do you come and talk to you? What, what kind of things are, are, they, are they worried about? Everything from all sorts of fraud in banking and in the financial services arena, right the way through to people working in hospitals, in the wards. I meet the doctors that Annie talks about. I meet the nurses. I meet the bankers. But ultimately, everybody who comes forward, the first thing they say isn't, I want compensation. But as they go along the line, what they need is a roof over their head. And, this, and the protection that we currently have, and it's not just limited to the UK, it, that's in place is so poor, it's all retrospective, that people have got to prove that they're right 
whistleblowers aren't investigators. They're not law enforcers. They don't have the powers to do any of this. All they can do is bring forward some information and they want somebody else to look at it and they want to go back to their life. And that sounds like a common sense approach to me. I mean, I mean, it, it, You've got, we've got to talk about what is the incentive for people to blow the whistle on, on wrongdoing in their organisations? And is more protection being put in place? I, I think there's a Europe-wide directive that uh, could protect them, but I, I, how, how safe are people to say, look, my organisation is doing something wrong and I want to tell someone about it? Sure. So at the moment in the UK, um, they're not very protected at all. The UK was one of the first um, countries to bring in a dedicated whistle law, whistleblowing law, the Public Interest Disclosure Act, but it's not aged terribly well and it's well beyond um, sort of basic international standards at the moment. Um, this spring in, in, in Europe, we, um, a European directive on whistleblower di um, protection was passed. Um, it's pretty good. It's not absolutely perfect, but it's pretty good. And it includes um, provisions for protecting those who come forward, but also obligations on employers and organizations to set up whistleblowing right. channels and to investigate complaints which are made, which is very important because Whistleblower protection. Because, yeah, whistleblower the, the protection goal is, of the whistleblowing is to make sure something changes, of, of right? Of course, right. It's, Most it's whistleblowers, when, when they come forward, I mean, yes, it, it's good to know that you're not going to lose your job and your livelihood over making your discussion, but ideally, most whistleblowers actually sort of want their complaint to be looked into as well. So what's happening in Europe is, is pretty good. It's... Um, it accords quite well, quite well with, with, you know, sort of leading international standards. Of course, passing a law is not the end of the story. No. Um, and laws that, even laws that have been passed in the past few years, um, they're not, the enforcement sometimes leaves a little to be desired, but it's one essential um, step on the path. And so we are making I progress. wonder if there are different standards, though. Annie, for example, working for a security yeah. service, and we've seen... Um, the treatment of, of whistleblowers who've come forward um, uh, uh, talking about the, the NSA in the, in the yeah. US and, and, and uh, military secrets and, and, and Annie with MI5. Annie, do you feel that there is um, less protection for you because you were working for a security service and you were sort of, in some ways, you were expected to do what you had to do and put up and shut up for the security of the country? Absolutely. There is no protection for intelligence whistleblowers. They are specifically excluded from any form of legal defence under Section 1.1 of the 1989 Official Secrets Act. So we have that in place to stop whistleblowing from the intelligence agencies. We have another law, almost it's even older than the American Espionage Act from 1911, Official Secrets Act, to prosecute traitors. However, what we have at the moment is a couple of years ago, the Law Commission was asked by the government, Theresa May's government, to um, review all the different um, historic official secrets acts and try and homogenize them into what they want to call the Espionage Act. So the Law Commission has now decided that actually they want to increase the penalties against whistleblowers from two years per charge in prison to 14 wow. years in charge um, uh, per charge in prison, which is what traitors currently get under UK law. Mm. And even worse than that, Journalists are also going to be facing the same penalty of 14 years if they cause damage by reporting what the whistleblower says. So actually in the UK, things are going backwards. I mean, is this an important issue that a whistleblower to one person is a traitor to another? Is, is that a big issue? I think it's more a feature of press rhetoric than it is... A, a real issue out in the world. I mean, I don't. I mean, there's a lot of discussion. Like, is Edward Snowden the hero? Is he a traitor? I don't think there's anyone really outside but of the it, NSA. But in the who US, that... uh, there, there's a lot of. Mm. I mean, uh, in mm. political circles, uh, sure. that that he is a traitor and is now being forced to live in in Russia, um, and is being charged for, um, or would be if he was in the US, for criminal activity rather than whistleblowing. And so this, the perception seems to be one of the problems. Um, the perception is one of the problems. I think that Edward Snowden's actions really, I mean, at least in Europe, had pretty wide approval ac across the board. If you look at the awards, his one, I think at yeah. one point, one in two people in Germany thought that he should be granted asylum. Yeah. In the US, yes, there is an open indictment against him. But it hasn't stopped him, him but, being hounded out but of his country. Been, well, but he's, been, but he's been charged under, as Annie says, with, there's a, with discussions about bringing in an espionage act in the UK. There is an espionage act in the United States, and that's what whistleblowers are prosecuted under. National security whistleblowers in the United States, and it's a like our Official Secrets Act. There is no public interest defence there. So, and the public and the public interest 
was this was this disclosure worthwhile? Was it useful? Has it changed I mean, laws? Has it changed the, the discussion? Seems That's what it's to all about. Protect wrongdoing by governments. Then, uh, am I wrong to say that? Or? No, I think I think you're absolutely right. That not just governments; it, it's organisations because yeah. we're all interconnected. And it's when you start to separate things out, that's what makes it easy to cover things up or bury them. And we, when when Annie talks about homogenisation of legislation, that's what I'm very much wanting to hear because current all of our current legislation has been weaponised against people who speak out. It's retrospective. It's punitive. You've got to prove something. But actually, the European directive is going on the right step to, towards saying at least we have to investigate. Now, I'm sceptical, as, as my friend Naomi knows, about how those governments will introduce this legislation, which is why I'm working more closely with an all-party group in the UK to look at... And they've all accepted that, that all of these legislations need to be looked at together and look at how we can properly protect whistleblowers because we have what ends up being a pile. The original whistleblower who disclosed something can quite often disappear, but it's the people who are left afterwards who are so trying to investigate. Do we need whistleblowers in, in a democracy? Do we need whistleblowers? Oh, absolutely. And, and I mean, the great irony here is that whistleblowers can actually be positive for governments as well as for absolutely. the people more broadly. And indeed, what you see in the US is that whistleblowing is positively encouraged because it identifies fraud on the government, costing taxpayers well, our money. Well, President Trump would take that view right at this moment. <laughs> well, that's true, but a lot of the people working close to him would still say it actually is a good thing. Um, obviously, he doesn't like it because he's the target, but for good reason, maybe. Um, but in many, many cases, it is positive for the government and for the public as well. Do you agree with that? <clears throat> yeah, I th whistleblowers? Yes, I do. And I think that when in, the, in this world, you're making that, uh, that argument to organisations all the time. Sometimes you don't use the word yeah. whistleblower. You talk about yeah. speaking out or creating internal channels so that people can raise concerns. And it's in the interest of organisations yeah. to do that. It's a... It's a sort of very cost effective, you know, cost effective well, and effective way of making sure. Have pathways where concerns can be raised in the first place. Um, they should do. I mean, after under the <clears throat> European Directive, it will become a legal requirement for companies which employ employ more than fifty people to institute them. At the moment, there's not really a legal requirement. Actually, under PEDA, there's no obligation yeah. for companies even to advertise to their employees that they have whistleblower rights. So we're on the cusp of that changing, which is very important. What we're seeing is that people are really aware of these uh, provisions, particularly in health and financial services, which were singled out in the UK in almost to trial these different uh, cultural shifts or bringing about cultural shifts. And yet there's been no prosecutions under the senior managers mm. regime brought in 2016. The, the um, freedom to speak up guardians in the NHS, they also, the ones that have spoken to us, are really concerned that they become the next target if they speak up on behalf of somebody. So back to this idea that uh, whistleblowers are good. They are good for business. They're the first line of defence yeah. against crimes, corruptions and cover-ups. And people like Annie need to have that uh, vehicle, some method, so they can speak out when they yeah, see something. But, I mean, Annie's point right at the beginning was yeah. that her concerns, your concerns, um, were not acted upon, were they? So you did what you had to do because you believed um, there were wrongs that had to be put right. Do you feel that that's been achieved? Did your actions change anything in a concrete way? Unfortunately, I have to say probably not. <laughs> and it's very depressing for any whistleblower to have to say that because it, going through a case like that can take up years of your life, um, leave you with very little money, no prospect of a proper job in the future. Um, and many other whistleblowers that I've worked with subsequently as well feel equally sort of helpless and hopeless that actually the big government just rolls over, steamrolls over whistleblowers. And that's very sad to see because all these people going into intelligence agencies, into government, into diplomacy, into the military, generally want to take a job that will actually make a difference. They can serve their fellow people. Um, and that's part of the motivation that takes them into whistleblowing. So for them to lose all that um, and then change nothing as well is incredibly difficult. This is why uh, organisations like Whistleblower UK that can offer help, learn from mistakes, um, advise people as they go through this process, gives me hope. Because I think you know, all people thinking like this do need to feel that they will be supported, not just by journalists or um, not prosecuted or anything like that, but also psychologically. It's a very difficult and very hard and very trying process to go through. You need sort of pastoral care after the process to readapt into the normal world. And say. Annie makes a, a really good point. I mean, from, what, from her story, 
it took incredible bravery to come out and talk, mm. uh, speak against not just an organization, but the, the, the mm -hmm. governance of, of the country and the secret, um, security intelligence service. Um, how much fear and concern do, do whistleblowers have? Oh, enormous fear and concern. Um, the vast majority of people who contact us um, do so under assumed names to start with because they don't right. even know if they can trust us. And uh, we, we have lots of conversations via encrypted software because, again, they, they don't want to risk that somebody might actually be looking in. Um, we meet them in random places. It, it, there's a huge amount of fear. And to get people to trust you and to make them feel comfortable is a, a big task in itself. And, and presumably the people you speak to are in the same boat. Absolutely the same boat. And what we're trying to do is normalise speaking out because we all actually do talk about things. We talk about it around the water cooler. And it's only when somebody realizes that they might be under threat that everyone backs away. Everybody knows about the, not everybody, but in most of the cases we deal with, dozens of people know, but only one or two people will actually speak out. Thank you very much indeed for joining me, my guests here in the studio and Annie in Brussels. Thank you very much. And uh, remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for TRT World Roundtable. But for now, from me and all the team here, bye-bye.